Hi everyone, good morning. Um, this is quite novel for me, but I'm looking forward to giving this talk. So today I'm going to talk um, about magnetic anomalies, um, global plate motions, and then how we go about making um, the age grid that many of you are quite familiar with. So if we just go to the next slide. Um, so basically, um, we've known since about the 1960s that we have, well, we've had this idea that plates move. So we have these moving plates. Um, and these have been confirmed quite recently through GPS measurements. So we can measure present day plate motions um, through GPS. But as geoscientists, we often want to um, get an idea of where objects have been spatially and temporally. So we want to get an idea of not only where things are in the present day, but where they have been in the past when they formed um, at a particular time, and also their associations with, with other objects. And so to do this, we sort of, we need to build up these global plate motion models. So we get an idea of a more extended Earth history. And often there are three main approaches to do this. Um, there are the geologically current plate motion models. And they're the ones that are mainly based on GPS um, measurements. And then we have the more traditional plate reconstructions, um, which I'll mainly talk about today. Um, and then we also have a, a third type of um, plate motion models, which are the more model predictive plate motions. So um, I'll speak about those in a second. So if we just move to the next slide. So if we think about geologically current plate motions, well, they're mainly constrained through GPS measurements um, and they consist of global absolute plate motions. So it's um, how the Australian plate is moving in an absolute sense, African plate, etc. So these are done, as I said, using GPS measurements. But in some cases, if we think about um, Nouvelle, um, for example, um, we get an idea, we also use some um, spreading rate information as well, just for the last, say, three million years, so that we get an idea of a slightly more extended um, plate motion. Now, the problem with these geologically current plate motions, well, they're the most accurate representation of global plate motions that we do have, but they're limited temporarily. So we've only got it, um, we only have this data for, say, the last three million years. So if we want to get an idea of um, where objects have been in the distant past and their associations, well, we need to use um, other methods. So if we just move to the next slide, um, this is when we go into looking at these traditional plate reconstruction approaches, and they're the most uh, common ones um, um, that people use and, and talk about. Um, and these use the seafloor spreading record um, uh, into the distant past, so back to the Cretaceous um, and uh, a little bit in the Jurassic, and also using paleomagnetics, uh, for the, mainly for the continental areas. And this is to reconstruct the ocean basins, the continents, any terrains that have accreted to the continents, for example. And so I've got a few images here of um, various, um, various groups that have worked on these global um, plate motion models. Um, so we've got an example of um, the work by Chris Cortese and, and, and others. Um, see that in the bottom right-hand corner. And then there's the Chitino and Scortese, Stampley and Burrell, and of course our group as well. We, we look at these uh, traditional plate reconstruction approaches. Um, as well. Now the problem with these traditional uh, plate tectonic reconstructions, well they have quite good temporal coverage so we can go back into the distant past um, and reconstruct these continents um, back to say the Paleozoic, um, but they're often just instantaneous snapshots so we might just have several reconstructions um, in 10 million year intervals so we don't really have a dynamically evolving um, um, plate motion model um, in, in some cases. Um, and so these traditional approaches is mainly what I'm going to be talking about today. Now the third approach, uh, so if we just move to the next slide, um, just for completeness, are these model predictive plate motions. So some, um, some groups have tried to, to use um, ideas of plate boundary locations um, and also uh, mantle depth uh, density heterogeneity to predict past and present plate motions. Um, and so this was done quite successfully by Lithgow, Bertoloni and Richards in 1998. Um, and more recently, Stadler et al. Um, published a paper uh, 
Olympics at last year, um, where they have been um, trying to look at present day, trying to predict present day plate motions, basically by using these coupled geodynamic and plate models. Um, now, unfortunately, these models are sensitive to boundary conditions that Juju put in, um, so they're very sensitive to the physical mantle properties, um, and these are all subject to uncertainty. So they they do a good job in some cases at predicting um, uh, plate motions, but but there are problems um, at, at other time periods. So these are still evolving plate models. So if we just move to the next slide. So as I said today, we'll focus on traditional plate reconstruction methods. Now these methods are um, in most cases underpinned by marine geophysical data. So it's mainly um, looking at magnetic anomaly data on the ocean floor. Um, and this is to get an idea, um, sort of to map the magnetic alleviations that we do find on the ocean floor, to get an idea of what the age and spreading rates and orientations are of the oceanic lithosphere. Um, and also gravity anomaly data, which allows us to map um, fracture zone traces, which uh, give us an indication as to the direction of relative plate motions between plates. Now, we use traditional plate reconstructions um, to compute Mesozoic to present day plate motions. So we use this um, to create um, these plate motion models, um, but we also use them to create the present day and the paleo age grids. Um, so if you just see um, in the images below, on the left hand side um, is just um, a gravity anomaly image um, of Australia and the Southern Ocean, um, and then a magnetic um, I think this is EMAG2, um, again, of the Southern Ocean, and then the age grid you'll see on the right-hand side. So basically using all the marine geophysical data that we have available to, to underpin the, the global plate motion model that's then used um, into the age grid. So if we just go to the next slide. So I thought we'll go back to, well, in Australia we call it Geology 1001. I think you guys call it 101. Um, basically back to... Um, to Wegner's continental drift. So basically, um, um, it, he figured that these that coastlines fit together like a jigsaw puzzle, particularly between South America and Africa. Um, he looked at paleontology and saw the distribution of um, Glossopteris, for example, uh, which was only found in the southern continents, um, uh, part of Gondwana. Uh, he looked at marine reptiles and saw correlations between continents. He also looked at paleoclimate indicators, so the distribution of coal, um, um, of carbonates, of where glacial deposits um, have been, um, for example, and also broad scale geology, so the continuity of fold belts, um, etc. Now, the problem with, with this was that he lacked a model to explain how these continents actually moved apart, and so that led to, to, to a lack of credibility for his model back. Um, um, when it was first proposed. And so if we just move to the next slide now, um, so this is when um, if we move forward, uh, we, we come into this um, a development that occurred around the 1950s, 1960s, um, and that was seafloor spreading, this idea um, um, that, that um, we had um, a new oceanic crust being formed um, like a conveyor belt system um, and then this provided a mechanism for this idea of moving continents. So it gave an idea of, well, um, um, of, of plates and how these plates have moved through time. Um, and so this was the Vine and Matthews hypothesis um, from 1963 and the idea was that new oceanic crust formed um, by the solidification of magma. Um, at the mid-ocean ridge um, during the cooling process and that when these rocks cooled um, below the quarry point, so around 500 or 600 degrees, um, it's, it's sort of locked in the, the, um, the ambient magnetic field at that time um, and we had this process occurring over and over and it was continuous and symmetric. So this idea of um, new oceanic crust being formed and then we had the, the idea that this rock cools and then um, the ambient um, magnetic field um, is locked in at that particular time. And so um, we can 
we, we then had ideas of what the ocean floor looked like. We could see magnetic lineations um, forming uh, during, during mapping. So we can see that on the right-hand side. Um, and this idea um, developed further. So if we just move to the next slide. So basically, by a combination of several things, um, but, in, but most notably seafloor spreading, well, it brought about the theory of plate tectonics. So this idea of continental degree plus seafloor spreading to give that sort of mechanism brought about um, plate tectonics. And so we're able to now move, move on and, and um, create these models of um, global plate motions. So if we move again to the next slide. Okay. So I'm not going to go through the, the basics of, um, of magnetics here, um, but basically um, just talking about magnetic stripes um, that we find on the ocean floor, well, they're um, basically variations in the magnetic intensity or direction. Um, and so we get these altern alternating stripes on the ocean floor which have these positive and negative magnetic fields because, well, the flipping of the Earth's magnetic field, it's preserving a different, um, a different ambient magnetic field. And so here we've just got um, um, a profile. You can see that profile there, and we have just a series of positive magnetic anomalies followed by negative magnetic anomalies, so these peak and trough patterns. Um, so if we just move again to the next slide. So, um, so what, is actually pres uh, what is actually measured? So when uh, ships go out and, um, and uh, conduct magnetic surveys, um, what they're actually measuring with the magnetometer, uh, whether it's over the continents or, or over the oceans, it's always the sum of the ambient field and the field originating from the magnetized rocks. So just as an example, on the left-hand side, um, the blue arrows there are just the normal magnetic field, so just the present-day magnetic field. Um, and then what we see um, in the image below is actually the, the um, preserved magnetic field in those rocks. So we can see that they have um, alternating polarities um, um, uh, as you move away from that mid-ocean ridge. And so if we look at that Im the image on the right-hand side, what we can see is that the actual total magnetic field that's measured is the Earth's magnetic field, so the ambient magnetic field. So if you look at that, uh, the arrow on the right-hand side, and then we also have the field um, from the actual crustal block. And so if it's, a positive, um, if it's a positive anomaly, well, what we find is that um, we have the, amb the ambient magnetic field plus the remnant magnetic field will give us that total field. If it's a reverse polarity, well, we get the um, ambient magnetic field um, minus the... Um, minus the um, the remnant magnetic field. And so this is what is actually measured. So we have to um, correct for um, the ambient magnetic field. So we need to subtract um, the ambient magnetic field in order to extract the, the magnetic anomaly. So the measured magnetic anomaly, um, magnetic anomaly we, we, we want, which is in the magnetized layer, is only about 1% of the total um, dipole field. So just an indication as to, as to the component of the magnetic field in that crustal block. So if we just move to the next slide. So if we think about magnetic anomalies, um, well, an observed anomaly is caused by an edge effect between two bodies with different magnetization. So if two edges are quite far uh, from each other, um, which we can see in that um, image on the right-hand side, if we look at the second, um, second image there. Um, if, it's, if we have um, two edges that are quite far apart, they'll cause individual anomalies, which are separated by an area where there's no anomaly measured. And so we get quite a broad um, anomaly. Um, the closer that these edge effects are to, uh, get together, um, the more the the two anomalies will interfere with each other. So if we just go to that, that bottom image there, you can see two edge effects that are only 10 kilometers apart and we get, um, we don't get this broad anomaly. They're actually interfering with each other. Um, so what we observe on the ocean floor um, is, is this edge effect, but we also have to consider that we're not getting just a nice um, anomaly just caused by the magnetic field. We also have to think about 
the fact that we have um, seamounts and we have other volcanic constructs on the ocean floor. So that sort of um, interferes with, with the signal. So it's not a simple model as shown here. So we'll see more um, variations in the character of the magnetic anomalies that we find. So if we move to the next slide. Um, so one of the things with magnetic anomalies is we have to think about what could potentially affect their shape and also their intensity. Um, so one of the things is that magnetic anomalies um, produced by normally magnetized blocks actually vary in character. Um, mainly, um, well, one of the major um, one of the major um, points is that um, the paleo latitude at the time of at the time of magnetization of that block is actually very important, um, and I'll go into that in a little while. Um, but the shape and intensity also depends on things such as um, mid-ocean ridge um, segmentation. So that has to do with um, um, with the length of the mag magnetized block along axis. So if we have um, um, a mid-ocean ridge which is segmented by, by fracture zones, well, we're going to get um, um, smaller um, lengths of magnetized blocks along axis. Um, if we don't have as many fracture zones, well, we're going to get, um, we're going to get much longer uh, magnetized blocks along axis. Um, another, um, another factor that affects the shape and intensity of magnetic um, anomalies is the spreading rate. Um, and so this has to do with the length of the block across the axis. So if we think of the uh, mid-ocean ridge here, um, so the spreading rate's affecting um, the, along, the, the length of the block along the axis. Now, if we have faster seafloor spreading rates, well, we're going to get more cross-formed um, uh, during a particular or finite time, um, and so we're going to get much broader and much um, much broader anomalies. Um, whereas if we get uh, if we have much slower seafloor spreading rates, well, we're getting uh, less material um, during a particular time interval, and so we're going to get um, narrower anomalies. Now, in some cases. Um, the frequency of the polarity reversals is also important. This also affects the length of the blocks um, across the axis. So if we have um, quite frequent polarity reversals, um, well, we're going to get um, anomalies which aren't as broad. They're going to be much uh, narrower. And if we combine that with, for example, a so slow seafloor spreading rate, well, we might, in fact, miss certain anomalies because um, um, because of the combined effect of the slow seafloor spreading rate and the frequency of the anomalies. Now, the other factor that um, influences the shape and intensity of the magnetic <coughs> the magnetic anomalies is the direction of the magnetization in a given block. Um, and this has to do with um, the orientation of the block and also its paleo latitude. So when both the crustal magnetization and the ge geomagnetic field ve vectors are quite steep, so this occurs um, near the magnetic poles, the normal blocks cause positive anomalies. Um, and we can see that in the image on the right-hand side. However, when we get near the equator, we have an east-west striking um, ridge. Um, these blocks will be magnetized in the same direction of the magnetic field, and they'll produce um, negative um, anomalies. So they'll just be a mirror image of each other. And we can see that in the image on the right-hand side. Now, another thing to note is that um, if we were to have, for example, um, north-south oriented magnetic blocks at uh, the equator uh, produced by spreading that was east-west directed, um, this will actually cause no magnetic anomaly at all at the equator. And I'll show you an example of this if we just go to the next slide. So here's just an example from the equatorial Atlantic. So here we've got a situation where we have um, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and we know that that's a um, roughly a north-south oriented ridge, and so the spreading direction um, was east-west. And so at the equator, um, what we actually have in the equatorial Pacific, so if you look at um, the equatorial latitudes on this map, so from um, down the bottom of the map there, you'll find that um, we can't actually distinguish any magnetic lineations. So here it's just um, an image of um, EMAG2. Um, so we can see in the north, if we look at the North Atlantic and the Central Atlantic, we can see these magnetic lineations um, in that magnetic grid. 
But as soon as we move into the equatorial regions, um, the signal just isn't there. We can't follow these magnetic lineations. And this is purely because we have this north-south oriented block at the equator producing no anomaly. Because we have this situation where we have our uh, magnetized blocks oriented north-south, so our profiles um, where our magnetic anomalies are would be east-west, and then the magnetic fields coming in um, in this direction, so therefore there's no magnetic anomaly um, that can be measured. Okay, so if we move to the next slide now. So now we move on to looking at magnetic profiles. So um, uh, what we do, um, and this is all part of how we build this global plate model and, and the age grids, is um, we collect a whole lot of um, um, uh, ship track data, so uh, publicly available data mainly, um, and also some, some data we get from the geological surveys. Um, and we try and get an idea of um, what the age of this ocean floor was. So here I'm just going to go through an example of the Tasman Sea. So the Tasman Sea is just off the east coast of Australia. <clears throat> um, and it was an ocean basin that formed um, between about 83 million years ago um, to about 52 million years ago. Um, and it basically, we had Australia and we had some um, continental crust, what, what we now call the Lord Howe Rise, were together and then um, these spread apart starting at about 84 million years. And so in the Southwest Pacific, you see a lot of submerged continental material. Um, <clears throat> and so I'll just go through the example of how we reconstruct um, the seafloor spreading history of the Tasman Sea. So basically, um, on the right-hand side there, you can see a map which has just the gravity anomalies from Sandwell and Smith. And then all the black lines on top there um, are just all the ship tracks um, um, in the area um, that we had um, in our database um, that we could then um, extract mag magnetic anomaly data from. So if we just move to the next slide. So here we have examples of what the magnetic profiles look like um, along um, some of the transects in the, coral, in the um, Tasman Sea. And so what we have here um, down the bottom um, is we have um, the geomagnetic reversal time scale. So you can see those alternating black um, and white um, bands. Um, so that's the geomagnetic reversal time scale showing the positive and, and, um, and negative magnetic reversals. And then on top of that, we have a profile, which is a synthetic magnetic profile, uh, which we create um, based on uh, uh, giving a particular spreading rate for this area, um, a particular orientation of the mid-oceanic ridge, a, a latitude of where um, this area formed, and the depth of the magnetized block, so that we can get a, um, um, a synthetic model of what we think the magnetic anomaly should look like in this area. As we said before, the spreading rate um, really does affect the shape and intensity of those of the magnetic anomaly. So we have to try and get the best um, approximation for this area as we can. And then above that synthetic model are just the um, magnetic anomaly profiles from these ship tracks. <coughs> um, and so um, what we do is we um, is we correlate between these magnetic um, anomaly ship track lines um, to that synthetic profile and then to the um, geomagnetic reversal time scale. And so we can find that these profiles actually look um, uh, uh, quite similar, or we hope they look quite similar, and we can actually um, try and date those profiles. Now one of the things we do is we try and uh, keep a consistent way of tracking where we actually um, correlate these, um, these magnetic um, these magnetic profiles. So we don't just want to randomly um, just um, pick points along these profiles where, where we think they, they correlate. We try and keep a system where we choose either the old or the young end of the magnetic anomaly um, and try and keep that consistently between profiles um, so that we actually get um, accurate um, age, ages along those profiles. And so this is uh, what we do. Um, we do. We did this for the Tasman Sea, for an example. This is the work of Carmen Gaynor from uh, 1998, I think. Um, <clears throat> and so, so we we do this um, consistently um, in other areas. Um, we also um, 
um, use a lot of published data um, for other people who work on other areas um, also do this kind of work and so we, we try and get their data so that we can incorporate that into our age grid. And so if we move to the next slide, so here is basically what we correlated on the previous um, image but placed onto the map. So we, um, we created these magnetic um, anomaly identifications, um, so these or magnetic anomaly picks they're often called. Um, so we translate from the magnetic anomaly profiles onto, onto the map here and so each, um, each anomaly that's picked is represented by, by a pick or by a dot. And so here we've just got, um, I think, about um, six different um, time periods where we've picked um, magnetic anomalies. And so once we do that, well, we're able to get an idea of um, the correlations between profiles. And so we get an idea of the orientation of spreading um, and, and the age of the oceanic crust as a result. So if we move to the next slide. So one of the other things, as well as looking at the magnetic anomaly data, it's also important for us to get an idea of what the spreading direction was um, using the gravity anomaly data. So I'm not going to go into um, gravity anomaly um, data here, um, but just suffice to say that um, what we do is we, um, we map out all these fracture zone traces. So if we just move to the next slide. Um, so here is just, um, um, just a map of the Southern Ocean again in the Tasman Sea on the right hand side there. Um, and so this is just the gravity anomaly map. And we can already see uh, quite clearly where, we, where there are some fracture zone traces. And then if we move to the next slide, um, we can just see um, a visual representation of some of these fracture zone traces, which give us an idea of what the, the direction of motion was between the two plates. So if we look at the Tasman Sea, for example, on the right hand side, well, now we have an idea of what the, the um, direction of spreading was in, in that area. And we can combine that with our magnetic anomaly data um, in order to try and reconstruct the basin. So if we move to the next slide, so basically as I, as I just said, um, we use, we combine um, the magnetic anomaly uh, data with the fracture zone data. So we create what we call fracture zone peaks um, as well so that we can use both constraints to try and get an idea of, of um, the relative motion between these two areas um, and how they spread apart. So if we move to the next slide, and so um, the next step in, in how we create these global plate motions and, and the um, age grid and the paleo age groups is we work out what the relative motion was between, um, between, um, between two plates. So if we just keep the idea of the Tasman Sea, for example, well, we need to work out um, what the relative motion was between the Australian plate and the Lord Howe Ice plate and the several um, blocks associated with that. So we do this by calculating finite rotations um, and finite rotations or uh, more correctly I should say finite reconstruction poles and angles, um, they're also called total reconstruction poles and angles in case um, you hear that term. Um, so these are, um, these are used to reconstruct a plate from its present day position um, to some time in the past. So we can see a representation of that here, so in the image on the right hand side. Um, that red dot that you see is what we call the finite rotation pole um, and we can see that it is a representation of um, the rotation from the present date to some point in the past. So in this case it's to point to time one for example. Now the thing with the um, finite rotations is while well, they have no knowledge of the complicated motion history in between that time period. Um, finite rotations are only, as we said, from the present day to some point in the past. Um, this is quite different to what we call stage rotations, which actually are, um, is the rotation between two time periods. And so if we use stage rotations, we can get an idea of the complicated motion history, so how the plates have, have changed direction. Um, so if we just move to the next slide, actually. Um, so here um, is where we talk about stage rotations. So stage um, rotations um, uh, sort of a, um, are an extension of the concept of instantaneous rotation poles, uh, but in the geological past. So we can't really measure the real instantaneous plate 
rotations um, in the past, so we just have to make assumptions, and so we just basically use two, two time stages. And so here is just an example on the right-hand side where we can see the stage rotation. So this is just the same orientation um, as the previous slide, but now these red, um, red dots are the stage rotation poles. So the one on the left is the stage rotation pole for plate, uh, for plate A, and um, the one on the right is a stage rotation pole for plate B. And so what the stage rotations are is, as we said, it's a rotation um, for an infinitely small period of time um, between two time periods. And so we can see that in this image that we're actually getting the rotation between, for example, time one and time two. And we can see that these stage rotations actually follow um, small circle segments. And we can use these to create a map of the, the of plate motion. So basically, we can use these to create um, flow lines. Um, and so if you look at that image, um, basically the flow lines are in, the, in blue, um, and then the small circle arcs are, are the, the red arcs that you can see um, in that image. And so we use um, a combination of stage and finite rotations, but the main model um, just uses the finite rotations to describe the whole model. Um, and so if we just move to the next slide, and so what we do when we combine um, our magnetic anomalies, our fracture zone um, picks, um, as well as this idea of um, stage and finite rotations. Well, this is a way that we um, actually try and reconstruct um, these ocean basins. So if we think about the Tasman Sea, for example, um, and we look at um, uh, the image on the left here, well, think of plate one as being the Australian plate and plate two being that Lord Howe Rise plate. And um, what we have are these crosses, which represent the magnetic anomaly picks. Um, and so what we try and do is say, okay, let's keep plate one fixed, um, so the stream plate fixed, and let's rotate um, the magnetic anomalies from plate two um, on top of um, plate one and try and minimize the sum of the misfits um, between these two sets. And so we try and, um, we try and reconstruct these two sets of magnetic um, anomalies to sort of match with minimal uh, misfit. Um, so that we can work out what our finite rotation is. Um, and most people um, use Hellinger's method um, in order to do this, um, but I won't go into um, Hellinger's method here. And so once we do this, and so we basically have our magnetic anomaly and our fracture zone data, um, and we, we, um, we minimise the misfit of uh, matching things up, we can create what we call seafloor spreading isochrons, um, which are basically just lines of equal age um, on the ocean floor. So here's an example again from that Tasman Sea um, where we have a map um, of um, seafloor spreading isochrons in black, all these black lines. Sorry, we're moving to the next slide now. Um, so here we've just got um, a map of the Tasman Sea again. Um, so this is showing in the black lines are just the seafloor spreading um, isochrons. And then we also have um, a grid underlaid of the age of the oceanic lithosphere. And so we use these magnetic anomaly identifications um, and as well as the, um, the finite rotations um, to create our conjugate um, isochron set. Um, and so if we just move to the next slide, so here is just an animation um, of um, the Tasman Sea reconstruction. So this is just a gravity grid animation. Um, this was done by Carmen Gaynor. Um, basically just showing how we've used the magnetic anomaly data, fracture zone data, to create our finite rotations to then build our model of how the Tasman Sea opened, so what the seafloor spreading history was like um, east of Australia there. And so this is just an example, just one example of the Tasman Sea of how we, we build our, our global age grid model. So uh, if we just move to the next slide, um, this is just a map of the global age grid. Um, and so we basically use the same principles um, in other areas. Um, in, in, in a lot of areas, we do get data from, from um, um, other published results um, and we incorporate that. So it's not like we've uh, reconstructed every single part of the world. Other people um, have contributed to that effort. And so um, 
the data sets that really go, if we move to the next slide now, so the data sets that really go into creating that present day age grid, well, as we said before, it's all underpinned by the marine geophysical data. So we use a lot of ship, um, um, ship track database um, with the marine gravity and magnetic anomaly, um, as well as bathymetry data. Um, we also use satellite altimetry gravity data, um, seismic reflection data um, in cases where that's available and useful. Um, and also geological data, um, particularly when it gives us an idea of, um, of subduction um, and the subduction of mid-ocean ridges, for example. Um, mid, um, ocean drilling data, of course, and industry world data also goes into the building of this age grid to try and sort of ground truth um, um, the magnetic anomaly interpretations. So if we move to the next slide, this is just showing the um, magnetic anomaly PIC database that goes into the present day age grid. So it's constrained by over 45,000 magnetic anomaly identifications. So here um, is um, in black, all those black points are all the magnetic anomaly identifications that are used uh, for the present day age group. So you can see that it's quite an extensive data set. And the magnetic anomaly picks, as, again, as we said, it's um, based on uh, many groups um, have gone and very carefully identified um, these magnetic anomalies on the ocean floor. And so this goes towards creating the present day age grid. So if we move to the next slide, just a, a map of the present day age grid. Um, and so basically moving from all those magnetic anomaly picks um, um, to this present day age grid model. Now, the other thing that we do, um, if we move to the next slide, is we want to get an idea of um, not only what the present day distribution of um, the age of the oceanic lithosphere is, but what the age distribution was um, back in the past and what was the configuration of the continents. Um, and so uh, one of the efforts that we've been undertaking is to create uh, paleo age grids, so age grids that can extend back, um, back in time to at least uh, the Cretaceous or the Jurassic. And so if we look at the image on the right hand side there, that's from Shatino in 1998, um, this is a reconstruction um, at 65 MA. So it shows us an idea of which oceanic crust that's um, currently preserved and then all the oceanic crust that would have existed but has now been subducted. And so you can see that um, it requires, if we want to get a, an, an, age, um, an age distribution um, back 65 million years ago, well, we need to try and fill these gaps um, and try and get an idea of what um, the ocean floor looked like back in the past, even though all evidence of it has been subducted. And so this is one of the efforts that we that we work on. So if we move to the next slide, so in order to create these paleo age grid models, um, uh, where we reconstruct what are now vanished ocean basins, well, we create, um, we try and create these synthetic plates. And we do that by using the preserved oceanic crust um, as much as we can. So using the magnetic lineations and fracture zones in present day oceanic crust, um, and just using very simple rules. So just assuming that spreading was symmetric to try and get an idea of what um, conjugate pet plates may have looked like if those conjugate plates have, has, have, been su have su subsequently been subducted. Um, we also look at onshore geological data, um, as I said before, to get an idea of um, um, have there been places where there's been um, a known mid-oceanic ridge subduction, and if so, well, we can design, um, we can, um, we can design our model to, to try and account for where these mid-ocean ridges um, have, have been in the past based on the geology. And we compute these relative plate motions um, between, between plates, and then we anchor that to an absolute reference frame. Um, and I think you'll be learning more about absolute reference frames in another lecture. So just as a um, short example of how we do this um, to try and reconstruct Panthalassa, so the ocean basin that existed um, uh, before the before the present day Pacific. Um, so basically, we look at um, the preserved magnetic lineations in the Western Pacific. Um, so this is just a map of magnetic lineations from Nakanishi et al. in 1992. And so. Uh, basically, we can see in this area that we have um, three sets of magnetic lineations that are oriented in three different ways. So we can see what we call the Japanese lineation set, which is oriented um, 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 northeast to southwest. We can see the Hawaiian lineation set, um, which you guys 
probably be familiar with, um, which is oriented um, northwest to southeast. And then we have the Hawaiian set, uh, sorry, the Phoenix set, which is um, in the southern part of this image, which is roughly oriented east-west. And so we know that we had three different seafloor spreading systems um, that existed in this area. Um, and this has been interpreted um, as representing um, spreading between the Pacific and Izanagi plate for the Japanese set, the uh, Pacific and Farallon plate for the Hawaiian set, and the Pacific and Phoenix plate for the Phoenix set. And so we can use um, this preserved um, magnetic lineation pattern to try and get an idea of what the conjugate now subducted parts um, of these plates were like. So we reconstruct the now subducted parts of these plates. And we do this just by simply assuming that spreading was symmetrical um, and that it extended um, during the time period that we have the preserved um, information. And then we can also make some other assumptions by looking at the geological history of Eastern um, um, East Asia, for example, to get an idea of when we think a mid ocean ridge subduction event occurred. So if we just move to the next slide, so here we've just got a map of um, the interpreted magnetic um, or the interpreted seafloor spreading isochrons um, for, um, for this area of the Western Pacific. So we can see these three, well, we can only see two sets here. So we can see in green that those um, um, seafloor spreading isochrons caused by Pacific is an Argus spreading. And then in red, we can see um, the isochrons um, created by Pacific Farallon spreading. And so we can use these to build our model of how we think the Pacific uh, or Panther Lassa um, formed. And so if we just move to the next slide, so here's just an example, um, it should be a movie, um, basically just showing how we've reconstructed um, Panther Lassa. So basically we can see these three separate spreading systems. So we have the um, Pacific plate in the center there, you can see the Pacific Triangle, and then we have the Izanagi, Farallon, and Phoenix plates radiating out from, from that. And so basically we try and um, we use that preserved seafloor spreading record um, to just make simple assumptions um, of spreading symmetry um, and then just simple ridge, 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 triple junction closure um, to, to build this model of how we think that this area formed. So this is one way that we construct these paleo age grids. So if we move to the next slide, um, we can see, we can also uh, take an example from the Tethys, so I think I'll just um, rush through this. Um, but basically we can follow the, simple, the similar principles for the Tethys, so only for the Tethys we have more evidence from um, the, the, um, the conjugate margins. Um, so we have some preserved um, oceanic crust um, that's found off the west coast of Australia in the Argo and Gascoigne Abyssal Plains of Western Australia. And so we can try and reconstruct um, the, at least the neotethys um, based on this. Uh, so we get an idea of, of when uh, breakup occurred between Australia and India or several terrains that, um, um, like the West Burma block that, um, um, that separated from the Northwest Shelf of Australia. Um, and so we can use um, that seafloor spreading evidence that we have there, as well as geological data. Um, from all around the Tethian um, domain. So whether we're looking um, at Southeast Asia, um, 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 the India-Eurasia collision area, um, and further along um, around Arabia and the Mediterranean. Um, now, fortunately, um, we can also get some well data um, so that we can get an idea of when rifting, um, episodes of rifting occurred um, and when likely when C4 spreading would have initiated. Um, and so if we just move to the next slide, this is just an example of, um, um, of the Argo Abyssal Plain, um, so the northwest shelf of Australia, where we can look at the seafloor spreading record, but also combine that with the well data to get an, and subsidence curves to get an idea of, of when, um, of when um, there was that transition from, from rifting to, to seafloor spreading. So we could combine different sets of data to get to, to be able to reconstruct um, to reconstruct these um, vanished ocean basins. So if we move to the next slide again, um, so we can yeah, use these revised seafloor spreading isochrons, the tectonic subsidence history um, in the Timor Sea and Northwest Shelf. Um, and also we can look at reef related sediments in the surrounding continental um, area um, to, to look at um, the breakup history and therefore how to build these models of the Tethian Ocean. So if we move to the next slide again,
Um, this, these are just reconstructions of the Tethys Ocean, um, so sort of the proto-Indian Ocean, I guess you could call it. Um, and so this is how we've, we've managed to build this model um, for the Tethys. Um, we've also um, used um, Stanford and Burrell's model for the Tethys um, as a base um, to reconstruct the much older um, Meso and Paleo Tethys as well. And so if we just move to the next slide, what we have is just a movie showing the paleo age grids. So basically our reconstruction of um, the ocean basins um, from about 180 million years ago to the present. And so you can see how um, the ocean basins have, um, in, um, have evolved. Um, we can see that we had much, um, much younger oceanic crust um, back in the Cretaceous to Jurassic, and then slowly we're getting the um, an aging of the oceanic lithosphere to the present day. Okay, and then um, by creating these paleo age grids, we can do um, um, we can do um, other other things. We can look at, at seafloor spreading rate. So we can take the present day um, age grid. If we just move to the next slide, yeah. If we um, just take the present day age grid, well, we can um, extract what we think our seafloor spreading rates are um, in particular areas. And if we um, uh, create paleo age grids, well, we can get an idea of what we think the seafloor spreading rates were in the past based on our assumptions. Um, so we can so we can look at seafloor spreading rates. Um, and if we move to the next slide, um, one of the other things we can do is try and get an idea of what the paleo depth um, of the ocean basins um, uh, was through time. Um, and so by reconstructing, um, having these um, models for the age of the oceanic lithosphere um, back to back to the Jurassic, well, we can just use simple um, age depth relationships. We can test several models and we can, um, and we can compute these paleo depth um, estimates. And then through um, paleo depth estimates are quite useful um, for paleo climate model, modelers, for example, um, uh, so that they get an idea of, of what the of what the um, topography of the ocean basins was like, because that affects oceanic circulation um, and oceanography um, and, and gateway um, opening and closure, for example. Um, but we also use it to try and get an idea of um, what the um, long-term sea level um, history has been like. Um, so if we just move to the next slide, and this is just the last slide, um, this is just showing um, um, this is just showing a curve of what the long-term sea level um, has been like if we're just looking at the volume of the ocean basins. So basically we have our age grids, which is giving us an idea of what the age area distribution of oceanic lithosphere is. Um, we can convert that to our, our paleo depth estimate and um, incorporate sedimentation and, and lip production as well. And so we get an idea of the changing um, volume of the ocean basin. So how much um, so, sort of what the what the bowl looks like in order to, um, to get an idea of how that will affect um, sea level fluctuations if we assume that um, that water the water uh, the amount of water remains constant. And so here is just a map showing um, two things. So it's showing the long term sea level, um, just the red line um, that you can see there, um, just based on the changing volume of the ocean basins um, compared to other sea level curves. So um, we can see um, in um, gray and black are the two heart curves. Um, the blue line is the curve from the Muller et al. 2008 paper, and the green um, curve is, the, um, is from the Miller um, science paper, Miller 2005 science paper. And we can also see that this is correlating quite well with the changing um, age area distribution of the oceanic lithosphere. So we've got some just some histograms of the age of the oceanic lithosphere at three particular times. Um, so 200 MA, um, 120 MA and at the present day. So we can see how using these paleo age grids, we can actually um, start predicting or getting a better idea of what long-term sea level change has been like. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you.